Right, uh, it's 8.39. Let's move on to the other massive story from uh, football yesterday, and that was the annihilation of Liverpool at the hands of Aston Villa. I'm delighted to say David Myler is with us. Um, David, what the hell happened? Um, I, don't, I don't even know where to start with analysing. I think it was um, it's just a really, really bad day at the office, a calamity of defending errors, um, and they were punished. Every chance that Aston Villa got, you know, they, they scored. Albeit, yes, there was two, three deflections in some of the goals, but it was just one of those days where every Liverpool player, probably Mo Salah was the only one who, like, you know, he could turn around and say, well, I got two goals, but it was just a, a really bad day at the office and just too many defensive errors, um, you know, playing that high line, getting caught out all the time, um, turning over chances, and they were punished. Is it, Explain to us a little bit about how having the world's best goalkeeper is such a fall off. Can you put it down a little bit to that? That there's an early mistake from the goalkeeper and suddenly the confidence drains from the team? Um, like you, we saw Jurgen Klopp speak after. He said these, you know, these things happen. They've happened in the past where you know it happens so early into the game that you you, th you feel you can bounce back. Um it's just like even if you go back to the smallest of things, which you know, I've I've not really seen anyone talk about, it, but if you look at even the past, Andy Robertson plays back to Adrian. You know, it's, a, it's probably a 30-yard pass, but the ball bounces into him rather than, you know, if it's on the floor and he gets it under control quicker. It's it's almost, it's early in the game. It's it's sloppy. Like, he just kind of hits a blind pass. And then, you know, it's it's just, it's a calamity. But when you do have someone like Alisson in goal, it's it's almost, you, you think we're fine. Because, like, if the defence makes a mistake, you think, my goalkeeper can dig me out. But then when Adrian makes that mistake, doubt does start to creep in. That that's normal. Um, you know, and then it just you know, to concede seven goals. Um, like if Allison had been playing, you think like what could he have done differently? I don't think the first goal happens. You know, the deflections are just unlucky, but it would add more confidence into the team and he would be demanding, you know, that the defenders are playing better and you know, the the spaces that they're giving up wouldn't have happened, I feel anyway. I, the other thing that like we just need to talk about is that there were a load of freak results as well. Like we didn't even mention Leicester being annihilated by West Ham. This was a Leicester team who played really well up mm. to this point, and um, you know they're, they're coming off the back of a really good season last year, and they've built on that squad. And so, how, how much of this has to do with the fact that there are no crowds, and so players are responding in different ways. Some players are actually emboldened to try stuff that they wouldn't normally try. There's no there's no nervousness, so they're actually getting the best out of them. And other players are a little less turned on by the fact that there's no crowds and it's just a training game? Um, like I spoke to Nathan um, not so long ago and we were chatting about it. It's almost like some of the games do have a feel of, you know, kind of friendly games or training games behind closed doors that there's always one team kind of seems to dominate the other team and they like go and, you know, pump the team four or five nil in training. It's almost a certain, like, if you look at like, Leicester obviously hammering Man City and then they go the following week and they get pumped by Man City. It's just, it's it's real to believe. Do you know, then you look at like Manchester United losing and then you look at Liverpool getting hammered. It's just, there is a certain thing without fans that the games would probably be a lot different. Certainly for the home teams because I think, you know, the fans would rally behind them. Like if you imagine, just imagine if at Villa Park yesterday, if Aston Villa had whatever it be, 40, 50,000 at the game, like, they'd have been bouncing off the roof, like, which would have, like, you don't know, would they have then, once they'd gotten, you know, a few goals ahead, would they have dropped a little bit deeper? They Would they have continued to, you know, push forward and create so many chances? Um, I do think the fans does play a part in it, but at the same time, like, some of the stuff we saw yesterday was very, very basic defending. That was, like, it just looked like players had the wrong boots on their feet. They couldn't do anything. Like they were just getting caught off. You know, a great example is, you know, for the second goal of Ollie Watkins, they try and play like Joe Gomez tries to play offside rather than just holding the line and going back with the player. He jumps forward, and if you get that wrong, you can't make that recovery when you can't get back. And I just think that, you know, with certain things like that and without the fans, like you asked me, um, there is a kind of a risk element that players aren't afraid to try things because you can imagine the crowd would, you know, would be on their back or there'd be there'd be jeers and all that. Um, so it does make it, it does make a difference, yes. 
And I, I, my point is that I don't think we can automatically say a whole team are going to be impacted. It's individual players within the team, and then some mm. teams are impacted. Like the, the lesser teams who might not try stuff against the better teams because they know that if something goes wrong, they're going to be like, oh, what are you trying that for? You know, we're, we're <laughs> supposed to scrape a draw here today. Whereas actually they try something that doesn't come off. Next time they try it, they've actually learned from it. And for the, for the big teams, you're at it every week. You're, you're like playing in Champions League finals. There's a sense of occasion every single time you play brought by the noise and the sound of, like the wall of sound that comes from the Liverpool fans in particular. If that's suddenly gone, and it's not that you're not professional, but like, what's the point of the crowd if it's not to actually give you an extra little bit of juice, a tiny little bit of juice, which makes you feel like a superstar and slightly immortal, and suddenly that's gone. No, you're you're completely correct. You look at Liverpool, has, like Anfield has been a fortress for Liverpool. There's always that famous thing: the cop end up sucking in, you know, the ball into the goal and what have you. That when they do play at home, yes, I know they were away. Um, against Aston Villa but at the same time when teams are at home and you have if it's a big club you have 50, 60, 70,000 at the game it does add an atmosphere like four teams then they, the players do yes it is individually players do get nervous if you know at times Jesse if you look at Aston Villa if they were at home and then players aren't early on in the game if passes aren't starting to come off and there's the there's the ho, oh, oh, you know, from the crowd. Players do get nervous and they stop wanting to get on the ball and stop trying to find those killer passes. Whereas all you have now is your teammates kind of moaning at you, which you can brush to one side. So it does make it does make a massive difference. Um, but at the same time, if you look at like the Manchester United and Tottenham game, you look at the Liverpool Aston Villa game, that defending is something you'd see, you know, on a Sunday Sunday training ground or whatever or Sunday. Sunday match at the local park with the lads, like the defending was just awful. If you look at, um, I think it's Nambele's goal for Spurs, like they're just all over the place. Maguire, um, like Shaw, Boy, like it's it just comedy. That was comedy stuff. It's yeah, it's it it's it was like what what's going on? If you look at it, I know there's a freeze image of when Big Harry goes to head the ball. You've got to head that ball back to here, like to leave it short, and somebody who's very good at heading a ball. Um, and then even just after Martial gets sent off, boy, he puts the ball down, tries to play, you know, they try to play out from the back and you're thinking, you've just gone down to 10 men, you're losing. Like, let's be solid and let's, like, build on this. Do you know what I mean? Instead, they just get to half time with the result it is and then we can regroup. Like, it's just all the stuff across the two games. Yes, Aston Villa were fantastic. Let's not no, take away from them. They did everything correct in the game. They created chances but not only did they create them they took them but then it's same with spurs like even before marshall was sent off they were dominating the game so you that was an inevitable that they were going to you know win the game unless something drastic happened you know manchester united's performance but it's comedy stuff uh, david just to go back to the idea of this being like training games like i can't imagine if liverpool are playing a training game and one of the teams in training that has gomez van dyke robertson and trent alexander arnold are conceding seven goals in any training game. Like, like this is the thing. Like, they conceded seven goals. They could have conceded 11, 12 goals. Like, it's mm -hmm. extraordinary the drop off. Like, we can't surely put that down to, to fans. We, we can't put this down to individual mistakes. No. There. Sure, there, there has to have been something else we saw yesterday. Um, like, if, like, well, I was going to say, if, if, if I were Liverpool, which I am, a Liverpool fan, which I am, I wouldn't read too much into it. Um, I think it was just a generally really bad day at the office. Um, everything, everything in the game just went against Liverpool. They got everything wrong. I think you know you have your good days, you have your bad days, but this is still a team that's off the back of winning a Premier League. You know they had a fantastic year, like before losing to Manchester City by a point and winning the Champions League. It's not as if it's become bad overnight. Do you know what I mean? That this is like oh, this is a sign that Liverpool aren't where they're at. I think it was just a really bad day where everything went against them. Like now they've got the international break, they've got everything coming up soon. You'd nearly like the beauty of it is Liverpool could come back and like obliterate Everton. Um, do you know, in that sense, like it's whether or not how long is Alisson out for, and then you've obviously got Henderson, Thiago coming back in. They're talking about Mate being fit. You know, you're hoping Mane is back, and then it's just a different dynamic of the Liverpool team. I wouldn't worry too much in the sense that I think they will come straight back and bounce back from it. Whereas on the flip side of that, you look at someone like Manchester United, it just 
there's there's warning signs everywhere. Are they going to bring in players in the transfer window? Like we saw Patrice Ever talking yesterday. People are always like, who's the ideal partner for Harry Maguire? Is it Lindelof? Is it Boy? Should they drop Harry Maguire, play Lindelof and Boy? There's just so many different things. Whereas I think Liverpool, on the other hand, it's kind of okay. We've had a bad game. Let's not panic. You know, we are only a few games into the start of the season. They'll come back. They'll bounce back. I still expect Liverpool to be there, thereabouts at the end of the season. Whereas other clubs who have started well, you can slowly see them fading away. Can I ask one question about Liverpool that is, is like uh, most worrying would be that other teams have been creating chances against them as well. Now, Leeds have been brilliant, right? So Leeds yeah. will create chances. But Leeds, essentially, there was a, a couple of chances that they created by somebody kind of in the quarterback position, kicking the ball over the high line and somebody running onto it. That happened a lot last night for Villa. Like there were, you know, four or five times in the first half and then again the whole second half. Have, have teams, obviously with the, the evidence and the amount of work that's being done, have they found a way to counteract Liverpool's high line that Liverpool are now going to have to deal with in a way that perhaps the Premier League was less self-confident against them uh, in recent seasons? No, of course. Um, when you concede seven goals in a game, you're going to have to... Like, I can imagine this morning, you know, Jurgen Klopp is sitting down with his coaches and, you know, his assistants, and they're they're analysing the game. Like, they'll have to think, where did it go right? Well, it didn't really go right anywhere. Uh, where did it go wrong? And then they'll identify parts that, yes, you look at the Leeds game, that was just crazy um, in the sense of the same thing, like... Liverpool are renowned for their full backs bombing on. Um, there's always been this you know, fascinating thing that Kenny Cunningham said about Fabinho. Yes, he's an exceptional footballer. Does he read the game defensively better than Henderson? That's one thing. Like It does probably get knocked on its head, the amount of work he does to cover Trent Alexander-Arnold. But if you look at Aston Villa's goals, a lot of them came from the left-hand side with balls coming back across. That If Henderson was playing in that holding midfield role, would that happen? But I just I think Liverpool will go and they'll look at it. And let's not forget Jurgen Klopp is an exceptional manager. He'll be well aware of what's gone on and they will tweak it. They will like they can't keep conceding, you know, this many chances in games because it, you can't you can't have to score four goals to win a game. Like I know like Aston Villa scored seven. But I can't see that Liverpool team conceding seven again anytime soon. Uh, David, just before we wrap, just it'd be good to get your take on the Seamus Coleman injury over the course of the weekend. How yeah. big a setback is this ahead of Thursday night? Well, Seamus is in fantastic form. Um, Everton are four out of four. They've been flying. Um, Seamus has been pivotal to that. And we've we've seen Carlo Ancelotti come out and speak so highly about him. Um, you know, and then obviously I believe it's his hamstring, um, which is not great because then obviously this is a huge game for Ireland and then your captain picks up a knock and he's out of the game um, it's it's almost a good thing in a way that Matt Doherty didn't play so that there was no fear of him picking up a knock because look it's a straight shoot off between the two of them if you looked at you know the last campaign or the not last campaign last international games Matt had a shoe in I think Seamus at the moment was ahead of him with the performances he's put in at Everton so you know, it's just it's a big disappointment, but I imagine the type of character Seamus is, I imagine he'll he'll probably still travel over, you know, to you know, be in around the squad to support them, you know, to to be that captain, to be that leader around the place, even though he won't be featuring. Great to have you with us, David. Thanks a million for joining us. Cheers, guys. That's uh, David Mollard giving some thoughts there on a remarkable night football.